joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amanda Ashworth as our seminar speaker for the day. Um, Dr. Ashworth currently serves as a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS group in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She joined the group in 2016. Um, she came to them uh, via Tennessee where she received her PhD. And uh, prior to that, she received both her bachelor's and her master's degrees from the University of Arkansas. Dr. Ashworth is recognized for her systems research focused on agroecological issues at the soil, water, plant, and animal nexus. She's been involved in numerous research projects addressing environmental concerns arising from animal agriculture through investigations aimed at developing best management practices to reduce non-point source pollution. She's authored 115 refereed journal articles and three invited book chapters and she's given or co-authored more than 90 presentations at national and international meetings. She currently serves on the board of directors for the American Society of Agronomy and as an associate editor for the Soil Science Society of America Journal. Amanda served, has served as a PI or a co-PI on over $30 million in competitive grant funding. She was awarded a Foundation for Food and Agriculture New Innovator Award in 2018 a USDA ARS Outstanding Early Career Scientist of the Year in 2019, Soil Science Society of America Early Career Award in 2020, and Crop Science Society of America Early Career Award in 2020. And it is my pleasure, um, and she has recently taken on a new position, which is why she couldn't be here today. Um, she's going to be the Acting Research Leader for the Sustainable Water Management Research Unit in Stoneville. Uh, Mississippi and it starts tomorrow. So she needed to stay home today to focus on her new um, on her new appointment and we are thankful she's joining us uh, via Zoom. Amanda. Thank you so much, Dr. McCauley and good afternoon, everyone. It is really an honor to be invited here and have the opportunity to talk about my work with each of you. And again, apologies for not being there in person to meet you all. And as I said, you guys are quite dedicated to have um, seminar Friday afternoon, so I'll do my best not to put you guys to sleep. Uh, so for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be discussing agricultural systems and how technology and tools are changing the speed, manner, and our ability to collect, store, and make meaningful inferences with all the information being collected. So right off the bat, I know you guys don't have your videos on, so you can just bear with me, but I wanted to start with a question. So by show of hands, how many of you feel that agricultural technologies and data analytical tools are changing at such a pace, it's challenging to keep up to speed uh, with, with the latest and greatest? So Rebecca's got her hand up, Ray does, I see. I have my hand up. <laughs> And how many of you feel that it's also hard to differentiate between kind of gimmick or shiny new tools and ag technologies that are here to stay? So I, I've got mine up to see lots of hands. That's awesome. Yeah, so I completely understand. And I hope that after today's presentation, you'll see how technology and systems approaches can help play a role in sustainable intensification, particularly in pastures. And so before moving on to uh, research, I wanted to give a little uh, bit of my background in history, um, which I think will provide some context um, for my, my work later on. So at my core, I look at agricultural issues through an environmental and conservation lens. Um, so I naturally gravitated towards an undergraduate in environmental soil and water science, um, which I did at the University of Arkansas. And I sought out um, two federal internships that really kind of hardened this interest for me. One was with the US Forest Service in Montana using GPS or global positioning systems to map invasive plant populations in the largest wilderness in the lower 48. And the second was with the Bureau of Land Management in California in which we safeguarded uh, 48 native species threatened by desertification through germplasm collection. And so both of these internships were facilitated by the Student Conservation Association, or SCA. And I'm assuming we have some undergrads on the call. So um, I would totally recommend these um, internships. Feel free to ask me about them, but they're great opportunities to gain um, kind of experience with federal agencies. 
Um, also, as an undergraduate, I took advantage of a um, US-EU research exchange program that gave research stipends to do projects in three European institutions for six months. And I chose ENRA in France. It's kind of like um, a federal laboratory network si similar to ARES um, because they had a strong LCA or life cycle assessment group there. And because LCAs are kind of like accounting tools for comparing environmental impacts of a product or process. And before going into that internship though, I didn't really know if I had what it took to do a master's, but after that internship, a master's didn't really seem like that big of a leap. Um, so I pursued a master's degree with my mentor to this day, Chuck West, and um, it was focused on developing switchgrass growth and nutrient removal curves because one at the time, this was a somewhat new crop and we didn't have a lot of agronomic monthly data for this native grass. And two, because we needed this information to expand a crop simulation model known as Almanac to include perennial grasses, uh, which I did as, as part of my thesis. Um, but after I graduated, I, I saw a job announcement for a research analyst position at the University of the Virgin Islands. And I had the opportunity to work and learn about tropical dryland pastures and agriculture and living on island. So it was a no brainer. Um, and I was really happy, you know, eating all this wonderful fruit and they had 35 hour work weeks, which had become quite foreign. So I was quite content. Um, but one day my mentor, Chuck calls me and asks me to apply for this, um, this research associate position at the Center for Native Grasslands Management. Uh, because he knew what I'll share with all of you is that I, I love native grasses. And at the time, the University of Tennessee had the U.S.'s first switchgrass to ethanol biorefinery. And I would have the chance to work on solving agronomic challenges to making liquid fuel out of a native grass. So I somewhat reluctantly applied and ended up moving to Knoxville. And I worked there uh, for about uh, two years uh, as a research associate until a collaborator Fred Allen, who was a plant breeder in the plant sciences department, department wore me down and, um, agree, and I agreed to pursue a PhD. And I say wore me down because I fundamentally did not think I possessed the intelligence or ability to function at the PhD level, but he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And so for the next two and a half years, I worked full time in one department and I pursued a PhD in another. And so, you know how in therapy, we, we blame our parents for our issues. So I'll be blaming my, my mentors for some of my research ADHD that you'll see a bit later. So I, I currently, as Dr. McCauley said, I'm a soil scientist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service or ARS. And so this is the research branch of the USDA. And I'd be remiss if I didn't just take a moment to describe our agency. So it is a wonderful place to work in the event any um, grad students are in the job market. Um, but we're in the executive branch of the federal government and I'm located in Arkansas. And so, uh, which is, uh, ARS is divided into areas. So we have five areas and we're in the Southeast area. And interestingly, Kentucky is, is not in the Southeast area. Um, but our agency's mission as it's relevant to today's topic is delivering scientific solutions to national and global agricultural challenges. So it is our agency's uh, perspective and it's uh, the perspective of a lot of people that, that I work with that it doesn't do a lot of good to point to a problem without having some solution. So we're really a solutions oriented organization. And um, these are just a few of the technology transfer successes from ARS. And they range from penicillin production to the popular mosquito spray DEET to um, lactose-free milk. So um, and these are, again, just a few. Um, we also have a lot of um, patents from, from my unit in Fayetteville, which is heavy on poultry, uh, as Arkansas is one of the top broiler or meat chicken producing states. And they range from alum, um, which is added to poultry manure in houses during production and it reduces nutrient losses to the air, soil, and water, and results in greater nutrient retention in this important fertilizer source. 
Um, also, we have some probiotics that have been developed at our location, and these are fed to birds, and they not only reduce the amount of antibiotics in foods, but uh, reduces antibiotic resistance, which you'll hear me talk about a little bit later. And so generally our agency is non-regulatory, meaning we don't develop laws, but occasionally our research is used to codify state laws. And this was the case with the, the phosphorus index um, that was uh, codified in 2010. So today you'll hear me refer to systems quite a bit. And I just wanted to take a minute to kind of define what I mean. So what do you think of uh, when you hear the word systems? I know it's hard to interact on, on Zoom, but for me personally, I kind of think of it like if you're looking at a, a dashboard um, and you, uh, or say it like a cockpit inside of a plane, if you move one knob, how does the other uh, parameters within that dashboard, uh, how are they affected? Because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? Well, the same in, in agro ecosystems. It looks like we've got some, Many components interacting, ecology, yeah, ecology, absolutely, yeah. And so I think it's just a different way to kind of um, visualize or think about agricultural systems. Well, the FAO has a bit of fancier definition than this. They define it um, as an assemblage of components which are united by interdependence and which operate within a prescribed boundary to achieve a specified agricultural objective. And like somebody mentioned, another way to think of this is kind of like an agro ecosystem to the right, uh, which kind of involves evaluating this interconnectedness as a functionally coherent unit of activity. Um, so really evaluating these, this interaction of, of these components rather than solely focusing on, say, crop or, or soil response to management, because no, no parameter in agriculture or the environment is functioning in isolation, and it's in, involved with lots of biotic and abiotic interactions. And so you'll see this kind of as the theme for the next few studies, which really aims to identify this interconnectedness or linkage in agro ecosystems. I think another kind of relevant um, example for today is how real-time continuous monitoring of soils, crops, water, and livestock are linked for prescriptive agriculture. So here's a bit of a, a teaser for some of the, the systems projects we'll be discussing today, and they're pretty varied. Um, so in the first, we'll be describing how soils and water drive plant growth and ultimately animal grazing in a silvopastoral system. Um, in the second, um, we'll be describing how precision ag tools um, are like tractor guidance can improve um, efficiency gains, even in, in pasture systems. And then thirdly, we'll take a look at how uh, conservation pasture management practices can improve a system's one health or the, the soil water animal health. Um, and then lastly, um, how digital tools are being used to deliver spatially precise soil information on US tribal lands. Uh, but before moving on to some of these projects, um, I wanted to give a shout out to some folks that had a hand or in some cases two hands in these studies. Um, everyone on my team has a diverse set of skills ranging from computer science to soil physics, forage agronomy, microbiology, really all things in between. And since this is collaborative work, I wanted to give them credit up front. Okay, so now on to the research. Um, in this first system study, we were interested in evaluating how spatially variable landscape attributes influence preferential grazing, or more simplistically, why do cows selectively choose to graze one area in the landscape over another? And to see if it is linked to soil nutrients, soil water, plant growth, or terrain, or, or things like slope and topography. Um, so about 20 years ago, five different tree species, including oak, pecan, cottonwood, pine, and sycamore were established. And then about um, five years ago, we planted um, two different forage treatments in between these tree rows or alleys. Um, and they were a, a big blue stem, little blue stem mix, and then also um, orchard grass. 
And the second treatment in this study was soil amendments in alleys. So this was either poultry litter or control. And then working with soil mapping collaborators, we developed continuous soil property maps at the site of things like soil wetness, as you can see to this far right. Um, and then when also, you can also see we have a, an aquic or eudic or wet dry moisture regime at the site. And so these are known as digital soil maps, as you can see here, which we'll discuss a bit later, but they help illustrate the spatial distribution of properties on a two-dimensional basis. Um, so a unique property for every five meters squared. Um, so at its core, this is a spatial data layer study uh, where we're linking these um, landscape data maps by geospatial locations. Um, so lots of data are being collected and it ranges from atmospheric to animals. Um, so these GPS tracking devices are placed on cows. So when their heads are down and they're grazing for more than 15 seconds, a GPS coordinate is taken along with um, uh, the, the spatial information. Um, and then we also have plant data being collected um, for trees and, and forages, both quality and quantity, and then soil properties. So again, these soil maps, um, soil microbial diversity, root decomposition, that sort of thing. Okay, so this is kind of a, a simplistic schematic of this civil pastoral system on the left. Uh, but the idea is that we have animals or forages providing an annual source of revenue for producers, with the trees providing a more long term source of income. And this can allow for producers to have some flexibility to respond to market variations. And then also some ecosystem services are being provided like uh, less heat stress for cows due to the shade from the trees, uh, more carbon being stored from the deeper tree roots relative to, to monoculture pastures. So in the study, we're interested in using spatial monitoring technologies for coupling the soil plant water animal relationships in this system or how are soils and terrain impacting plant growth and ultimately where cows choose to graze. Um, so in terms of results right off the bat, you can see that these um, grazing patterns from our GPS tracking devices uh, are quite similar to some of our soil property um, information, particularly this map on soil depth. So this blue area is deeper and wetter soils. So these deeper and wetter soils are resulting in nutrients either shedding or concentrating, uh, which results in microbial and carbon storage differences, which is impacting forage growth, quality, and ultimately animal response, as you can visualize here. So, so patterns uh, were similar to soil nutrients, which is driven by water, and uh, which is ultimately driven by topography. And so from here, we used um, some machine learning, uh, which is a way to make inferences from patterns in data by allowing the data to learn from itself. And we use this to try to tease apart these linkages. And effectively, what we found is that animals grazing, their preference was influenced most by topography and soils, even more so than management, say forage species and fertility. And that really by combining these monitoring tools, uh, both animal and soil, we can help optimize real time grazing management um, spatially and temporally. So the take home really here is remember that kind of dashboard analogy where we move one dial and, and one is affected. Well, soil water was really the driving factor for soils, plants, and ultimately animals in this study. And that really knowing where wetter soils are, we can help predict nutrient flows and, and forage palatability and quality and ultimately where, where cows graze uh, within these landscapes. Okay, so speaking of, of water, but um, shifting gears to manure sheds, or in our case, a watershed that receives animal manure and is hydrologically isolated. Um, in the second project that I'll be describing, we have um, conservation practices that are recommended to producers in the US. And this is through cost share programs. So this is where they get financial incentives to implement these practices. But there hasn't been a ton of work to quantify some of the actual benefits from these cost share practices. 
Um, so a colleague of mine established um, these back in 2004 at our unit in Boonville to try to quantify some of these um, conservation impacts on water quality. So each of these watersheds has been continuously managed since 2004, and they range from best management practices like rotational grazing. Um, so this is where we pull cows off of pastures once the forages get a certain height. Um, we also have rotational grazing combined with a fenced off ungrazed and unfertilized riparian filter strip, as you can kind of visualize from this drone image. Um, and so the cows are not allowed um, to graze on this part of the, the field. And we also have a rotational grazing with just the edge of the field not being fertilized, but cows can, can access it. And then we also have some business as usual um, practices, including continuously or overgrazed. So the cows are in these watersheds year round. And then we also have a hay system. So this just means mechanical removal of forage. So there's no cattle manure inputs in here. And all these uh, manure sheds have received annual poultry litter, um, except for that riparian area, which also didn't receive cow cattle manure. Um, so each of these watersheds um, has been divided based on slope, as you can see here. So we have zones, so an upper, a middle, a lower, and then a bottom slope. And so every single um, rain event, we have collected runoff since 2004 uh, from these automated water samplers at the edge of the field. And so we have done a series of, of studies uh, to, to see about um, how these conservation practices affect water quality, as well as soil and overall watershed health. And so first we evaluated soil quality. And so this is the combination of, of soil physical, chemical, and biological properties into an index. And we used the Soil Management Assessment Framework, or SMAF. And so these evaluations show us that after 15 years of continuous management, the rotationally grazed, and interestingly, the overgrazed, had the greatest soil quality. And so we attributed this to the nutrient-rich cattle manure uh, for these treatments improving indicators because SMAF has a, a more is better assumption in the tool. And so really most of our, our tested conservation practices did not actually result in greater soil quality relative to the overgrazed um, systems based on, on these um, SMAF indices. And when we evaluated uh, water quality indicators like phosphorus, the rotationally grazed manure sheds though did greatly reduce total phosphorus in water by about 36%. And about 30, or excuse me, um, 60% for the rotationally grazed um, unfertilized riparian buffer strips. So quite a bit of a improvement there. Um, so the use of these um, edge of field buffer strips or best management practices were very effective at reducing um, phosphorus in these manure sheds. Um, one other important aspect of manure shed health that we evaluated is the potential movement of antibiotics and antibiotic resistant genes from animals through their excretia to soil and water runoff. Uh, because we know about 80% of antibiotics can pass undegraded through animals, but we don't have a ton of information on the movement of resistant genes from these manures to water, uh, particularly based on these different conservation practices. And I, th I think this is important given that up to 4 million people are expected to have um, antimicrobial resistant related infections um, in the next 30 years. And so um, among all the practices that we tested, after 15 years, the highest levels of antibiotic resistant genes were found in both soil and water in the overgrazed systems. And that these resistant genes were about twice as high um, um, in these overgrazed systems relative to the conservation system. So in other words, by including rotationally grazing in these buffer strips, we can reduce antibiotic resistant gene movement by about half in soils and water. And lastly here, when we, we pulled all this together in a kind of a systems level uh, watershed health evaluation, so a high number here means poor water quality. 
Um, we found that the long-term continuously overgrazed systems had poor watershed health. So really the, the take home here is that pasture management practices that maintain greater ground cover and reduce grazing intensity really drove water quality due to lesser soil compaction from cattle hooves, uh, which results in less nutrient runoff and erosion. And so based on these system level evaluations, these uh, management strategies like rotational grazing and buffer strips uh, did prevent pasture degradation and maintained the carrying capacity while reducing some of the pressure um, on soil and water. Okay, so we're gonna take a hard turn here. Um, and I warned you all about the research ADHD. So <laughs> um, in this third project, we're going to discuss the economic and environmental impacts of precision ag for forages. Yes, I said that right. <laughs> um, so tractor guidance or auto steer um, is a type of precision ag tool that uses GPS satellites to help steer, as you can see from this, this picture with our guys showing no hands. <laughs> um, and it allows for about a centimeter accuracy. And it ultimately um, results in more spatially precise applications of fertilizer, seed, and herbicide uh, relative to, to non-GPS enabled technologies or, or applications. So you can kind of visualize that here. Um, so when tractor guidance is off, there are more overlaps and gaps. And by our estimates, we reduce overlaps by about 6% and gaps by about 16. So you can see that here. So um, these red areas are overlaps and this is uh, tractor guidance off and this is um, tractor guidance on. So, so far, far less red area on the image to the right. So this really just translates into less areas that are getting double fertilizer or herbicide and areas that are getting none. And so this further translates though into um, saving US producers. It's estimated by about um, 13 million per year nationally by increasing these efficiency gains. Um, but so that no surprise, this technology is really being used on large farms and row crops, but there's not been a ton of adoption in pastures, which is the largest land use category in the US and also not a lot of adoption on small farms, which is about 80% of our farming systems. Um, so lots of potential here for um, adoption. So we really set out to kind of formally quantify some of these environmental savings of, of precision ag tools in pastures. And so we did this um, via a life cycle assessment and this may sound familiar because uh, it's what I, I studied in France. Um, but again, this is a modeling tool for quantifying the environmental impacts during a life cycle. So for our case, tractor guidance versus no, non-tractor guidance. And so what we found is that, yes, we can um, improve um, global warming potential, uh, groundwater acidification, surface water quality um, from adopting precision ag tools in pasture. So the takeaway was really that uh, more targeted and even distributions or applications of inputs does lead to fewer nutrients in water and more sustainable forage production. Um, and so we're trying to get this listed as, as a cost share uh, practice for producers currently. But we did want to see though, if this is something that can be economical uh, for pastures. And so uh, working with some ag economists, um, we tried to address this question. And so we developed a decision support tool called Tractor Guidance Analysis. And um, you can see our cute logo here uh, where producers can go into this tool and they specify their operation conditions for things like what crops they're growing, how many acres of each crops, um, what kind of tractor guidance equipment they have or they're wanting to, to purchase. Um, we ask them to specify their predominant field shape because this is something that um, affects efficiency gains. And so then um, we in turn give them information in the tool on things like um, estimated profitability. Um, how many years would this equipment take to pay for itself? Um, the output also provides equipment efficiency gains specific to their operation. Um, as well as information on, on what the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions are by implementing tractor guidance on their farm. 
because we really do hope that this removes barriers to adoption in pastures because what we have found through a series of experiments is that yes, this equipment can pay for itself even uh, relatively quickly for small farms and, and pasture systems. Okay, so the, the fourth and final um, topic I'll be reporting on today, and we're really going to go off road here, um, is about tribal lands and specifically technology and data gaps. So let me start by saying that this is by no means an exhaustive list of issues plaguing Native American producers, but I did want to paint a picture of some of the barriers facing these systems. So the first is infrastructure. Um, so tribal nations do not have the tax base for building necessary infrastructure to harness the potential of their food systems. Um, secondly, tribal lands have an intermixed land ownership and designation status, as you can see from this image from one of our sites. Um, so this example, there's six different um, land statuses. So you can imagine how that would create resource management and, and production challenges. Um, tribal communities also have long been excluded from government programs, including conservation programming and farm bill funding. And so um, that's also affected their ability to get um, a financial assistance for some conservation practices. Um, climate change is also impacting tribal farmers, particularly in the Southwest, as they're experiencing extreme and persistent drought. And this is really exacerbating poverty and food insecurity as illustrated by an overall 37% poverty rate for tribal families compared to 15% nationally. And on the Navajo reservation alone, there's about 40% of homes don't have electricity or running water uh, compared to um, about 1% nationally. And the pandemic obviously was also very um, difficult for, for Native Americans. They were about twice as likely to die from COVID. So all of this has really led to increased health, food, and resource scarcity um, issues on, on tribal lands. And interestingly, so tribal lands in the US, they fall under the jurisdiction of both tribal governments and US governments. And so due to their unique legal and land status, there's effectively basic to no soil information. And if it is available, it is far behind uh, what's available for the rest of the country, which is linked to, to food insecurity and yield gaps. Because really soil information is key to advancing agriculture and society. Um, and so reservations have, have again difficulty accessing these programs that improve soil health and production. Um, so um, through our FAR funding, um, we have uh, developed a program to deliver some uh, first ever soil property maps and land use interpretations for agricultural resource management, ultimately to increase um, not only the number of Native American students in agriculture, but also promote food security and food sovereignty. And so we're working on this goal uh, with the Quapaw Nation, um, which is located in the uh, upper right polygon, this green polygon. And so through this project, um, we have developed um, digital soil property maps on about 57,000 acres. And so um, this sets the foundation for soil crop and livestock and land use decisions um, at the farm and, and tribal nation level for trying to increase agricultural uh, productivity and economic development. Um, so these digital soil property maps, which you may remember from the, the first project we discussed, of things like soil pH, water storage, um, nutrients like phosphorus, uh, provide some spatially explicit soil information for precision management. So as you can see here, you can zoom in um, down to one meter and get um, unique property predictions um, at a very fine resolution. And so we hope by, that by knowing how a soil functions and what properties it has, you can manage your land better and optimize production. So kind of like the first project or the civil pastoral study where we found that soil information systems were really foundational for grazing patterns. Um, soil maps are also crucial for identifying where crops grow best and where they're most suitable. And then uh, consequently where they're most likely to yield best. And so we use these um, soil maps as a data layer to develop crop suitability maps. 
And we do this for two reasons. One, to kind of match crops and soils and to close these yield gaps. Um, but secondly, to implement the four R's or the right for nutrients, the right source, the right place, the right amount and the right time. Um, so interestingly, from our, our crop suitability modeling um, from the Quapaw lands, the optimum uh, agricultural lands in this tribal area are currently not being um, utilized. So in this image, red means um, high suitability, or excuse me, red means low suitability, green means high suitability. Um, and so uh, it suggests there are some yield gaps and that we can sustainably um, intensify um, some of these agricultural lands for this nation. And another part of this project um, in collaboration with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas has been capacity building and education. And so through this project, we have trained um, about 100 Indigenous um, undergraduate students on some of these novel digital um, tools through this Native Youth and, and Food Summit. And so um, this is a, a summer intensive training program, as you can see from this image. And so lastly here, um, so we're developing an, an app for um, iPhones to kind of store some of these um, spatial information. And we're hoping to do this in both English and their native language, and hoping that it will also act as a way to preserve uh, language about agriculture and the environment. And so um, once this app is, is finalized for smartphones, uh, producers will be able to pull up real-time spatially explicit soil information and, and land use information um, on, the, on their phones. And so this, this project has, has culminated in a recent um, NIFA project focused on coupling human and machine knowledge to optimize tribal food systems, um, which is also going to uh, develop tools and disseminate information to tribal producers for optimizing the production of culturally important crops and combating climate change, uh, specifically in the Southwestern tribes. And so kind of an exciting piece of this, this next project will be integrating uh, traditional ecological knowledge or TEK of soil landscape function into the map versioning, um, which will not only harden elder knowledge, but kind of help preserve this institutional knowledge uh, for use in climate adaptation. And um, we're gonna be working on this project in, on Navajo, um, Colorado River Indian tribes or CRIT and the San Carlos nations. Because uh, we really see there being a critical need to close agricultural technology and data gaps to kind of democratize technology and provide some adaptive tools for promoting food sovereignty. Okay, so I realized that was probably a ton of information in a, a short amount of time, but I hope it gives a different way of thinking about agricultural systems and, and different types of systems. Um, Here's an image from a word cloud we developed um, from big data, agriculture, and spatial and temporal uh, words. And so just lastly here, I've got my email, um, but if you have any questions or um, wanna collaborate or something, just feel free to reach out. And um, thank you guys for your attention. I think I kept it short, Rebecca, under 40 minutes. <laughs> You did, yeah, perfect job, Amanda. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Clap, clap, clap. And uh, and we will open it up for questions and comments from folks. We've got plenty of time. Amanda, on the precision ag work that would relate to pastures, we've our Chris Torch has done a few things. We just put in simple GPS units on ATVs for things like um, broadcasting. Um, frost seeding clover um, and we talk to the producers about how quickly you can pay that off you know a small unit like that the thing you had was that actually a program that people could kind of enter their own information cost and savings and things like that yeah so you mean the decision support tool we yes. developed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so we don't have um it's mostly geared towards planting um, or applying fertilizer um, okay. in, in these systems. We, we do include a drop-down option though for those 
those old school kind of GPS units you put in your car where it just is an AB line and you line mm -hmm. up during mm -hmm. um, applications. And so those pay for themselves like within the first 10 seconds of, of using them, that's pretty easy. But some of the more expensive equipment is is a bit um, a bigger pill to swallow for, mm -hmm. you know, adopting it. And so that's kind of where it's geared towards a bit more. But um, we have done some studies with those and they're very effective as well, um, even in, in pastures. Absolutely. So that's on a website that decision support mm -hmm. to download? I, yeah. Yeah, I can okay. put it in, in the chat. It's hosted at the University of Arkansas, but the ag okay. economists that we work with um, hosts, mm -hmm. hosted it on their um, institution page. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And it may take me a second, Ray. I can email it to you as well if it, OK. Amanda, I was going to ask just sort of how you how you got involved in the tribal lands work. I mean, um, how did that how did that co those collaborations sort of initiate? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'd never thought you know it'd be an, an area that I, I would work in and feel so strongly about. But um, I may have mentioned this on our faculty um, discussion. But we have um, the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative which inter interestingly is in the law school here at the oh. University of Arkansas. Um, and so um, Janie Hip, who started um, that institute is now the USDA's um, top attorney, the office of chief, of chief counsel, legal counsel or something like that. Um, so I um, became involved just through the Native Youth Summit. I was asked to, to give a talk and just sort of interacted with her and um, became aware of some of these agricultural challenges facing um, facing tribes. And I have enrollment in a tribe. And so I, I, I guess, came at it also from interest in, in that level. And then just sort of the more I found out about all the challenges and, and things like that, it's become... Um, really, I think, an interesting um, area to work. Like I mentioned, lots of opportunity for improvement um, to, to assist tribes as well. So I don't know what that means, Amanda, that you have enrollment in a tribe. <laughs> and it's that? like I have a, a, a member, I have a, like a, an ID, basically. <laughs> it's a state tribe, though. Yeah. Okay. So. But. You mean you have an official status? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Very like I oh, you uh you froze up on this there, Amanda. I don't associate with that. That's not why I'm I'm still here. Yeah, we can hear you now, but you locked up okay. on a there. Yeah. I disconnected from my VPN. Sure. Can you hear me now? We can yes. hear you now. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. So I said you have official status and you started explaining that and we didn't hear that. Oh yeah, so I have um, a membership or enrollment in a state tribe. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't think we still know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it means you have a, like you, um, you're, you have a membership with a, a tribal nation. So you mean you're one fourth or one eighth or Native American? Yeah, it's even one sixteenth. Yeah, it's super low. Okay. Um, but it's mainly just because of the relationship that we have with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative on campus um, that that mm -hmm. I that I work with tribes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other uh, questions from the from the crowd? Feel free to just speak up or put them in chat. Everyone's sick of hearing me talk, maybe. <laughs> but I think the Friday afternoon, Amanda, is not. Yeah. Um, it's not you at all. <laughs> I'll be that person, Amanda. Um, this is Aaron Haramoto again of the Cowpeas. Um, of the Cowpeas. <laughs> can you just, can you go into a little bit more detail about the machine learning approach that you used in that, um, that grazing systems trial? So are, are yes. you just collecting like, years so much data over so many years that machine learning is like 
the most efficient way to draw those connections? Yeah, we 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 started out with kind of a statistical, like a, a traditional statistical approach, and just quickly found that with trying to find patterns and linkages, it really wasn't an appropriate method to try to visualize patterns and, and specifically trying to kind of link these data layers geospatially. Um, and so uh, we tried a couple other things like um, partial least squares, like path modeling, and that that could also work, but we, we just wanted to try to kind of a random forest um, approach is kind of what we ended up going with there to, to kind of link these data layers. Okay, so yeah, just as someone that's not as familiar with the machine learning, so it's it's advantageous over those other things when you just have like a ton of layers that are kind of more difficult to manage, and then also you might miss um, miss relationships if you're looking at them with these more traditional approaches. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's I think a little bit more simplistic to go the machine learning route with what we were trying to do. Because okay. it kind of provides a hierarchy of like, this is linked to this, and this is driving this based on your response variables. So our response variable was the grazing um, patterns, and then uh, trying to kind of pull in the topography, this different soil properties, forage quality, and all of that in there. So it was a way to kind of look at all these different um, layers and make some kind of meaningful inferences um, relative to trying to go to a statistical, like traditional approach, so. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I am by no means an expert on um, machine learning. I, I work with a lot of smart people, so um, <laughs> they help. <laughs> yeah, understood. This is Randy Dinkins, can you hear me? We can hear you, Randy. Okay, yeah, I was curious on that GPS, the animal tracking study, um, there was one section there you had different layers with the different the water levels, the uh, phosphorus. But on the right side of that um, plot that you had, there was also a, a kind of a, a lack of animal grazing. Do you know what's going on there? A lack of animal. Let me go back to that. Are you guys still seeing my, my screen? Yep. Yes. We're still oh, seeing. okay. You probably saw me try to search for the tool <laughs> to send no, it right there. No, okay. no, we, no, we didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that's this what right you're... There. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, so what is the question again? In the middle on the right-hand side there. Middle so on the right it's side following like the wetness, the soil depths, the sulfur, and so on, but there's mm -hmm. that section there on the right-hand middle side. That's a lack of grazing as well. You know what's going on there. Right-hand middle. Yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah, the so right. I... To the right. To the right. A little further right oh, yeah. than you were. Yeah. No, I don't know. Um, it, just, it just popped out to me because it mm -hmm. follows, but then that section right there, there's a there's something going on there too. Yeah, I didn't show all of the, the soil properties. There was like, there's like 27, but um, there were a couple, and I can't even see what that is, that had that um, pattern and what we have done since then is take, um, I'm not sh sure if you're familiar with like um, electrical conductivity meters out at the site and that in that area was picked up as well. Um, so I'm not totally sure what is going on there. Our watering source is over here, but that would not explain it, <laughs> um, why this area is really um, also showing that pattern. I think these, these other um, maps, I think, overlay pretty well, but you're right, that yes. is kind of an outlier. Yeah, that one just jumped out at me because mm -hmm. it didn't follow all the other maps that you showed, so I was mm -hmm. just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure I really answered your question, but. <laughs> well, I'm not sure there was an answer right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so I meant to tell you also, this is the uh, USDA unit in Lexington. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I was hoping to, to see your unit in person. Yeah. yeah, so what area are you guys in? We're in the Midwest. Midwest, okay. Yeah, we used to be in the Mid-South, but before it got, so we were the split. I see. Well, we wish you guys were in the Southeast area. That would make sense, but. Well, there's some stuff here going on that I was going to talk to our group to talk with you. Yes, please do.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have a last question for Amanda from the group today? Hearing none, Amanda, I will say thank you again for joining us and spending your Friday afternoon uh, with us. We appreciate you sharing your, your research program with us and your expertise, and we will hope to get you in person next time. Have great. a great weekend. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody, Thanks, for hanging on. Thank you. Yeah. Take Very care. Very good. Bye-bye.